Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for taking your time out of schedules to join with us for Plenary 2. Um, we appreciate very much that the teams that are working hard while uh, managing all of the various issues in state government right now um, related to the uh, COVID-19 situation across the country. So we acknowledge and appreciate that you are uh, sticking with us and uh, working hard in your teams and, and participating in looking at your, your practice and policy about this population. As you all know, uh, the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare is an initiative of the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and the Administration for Children and Families and specifically the Children's Bureau. So we appreciate that support. We're actually in our 18th year since 2002. Uh, children and Family Futures has been operating the National Center and we would encourage you if you have uh, questions on any of the aspects of this population and the broader population of families affected by substance use disorders in the child welfare population to, to reach out to your uh, change liaison and uh, ask us questions. We, we like to get the questions and we have resources uh, to be able to help. I love that there's lots of folks of the uh, about 80 participants uh, now, 79 participants who are checking in with us from across the country. Uh, it's terrific to see everyone who is uh, participating. Uh, can we go to the uh, next slide, Lexi? It's really my honor to be able to introduce Dr. Matthew Grossman. Uh, we had the opportunity to hear from him once previously, a few years ago, about the work that he and his team have been doing at uh, the Yale School of Medicine uh, you see his title, and uh, just as a way of background, uh, he graduated from the State University of New York at Stony Brook School of Medicine in 2003, completed his pediatric residency at Yale New Haven Children's Hospital in 2006, uh, became an assistant professor of pediatrics at Yale School of Medicine and a pediatric hospitalist. Uh, he's been the quality and safety officer for Yale New Haven Children's Hospital since 2013. And in 2015, his team was awarded the National Pediatric Quality Award from the Children's Hospital Association. And as we have followed um, some of the work that Dr. Grossman and his team uh, have initiated, um, I'd say he's really sort of revolutionizing the way in which uh, families affected by substance use and mothers uh, with babies affected by neonatal abstinence syndrome are being treated in hospitals really across the nation. And he'll, he'll show us that at the end uh, about the, the uptake of these kinds of approaches across the nation. So Again, this PowerPoint will be distributed to you. The link to the webinar will be distributed. So we would encourage you to reach out to your hospitals that perhaps weren't able to participate today uh, and be able to share this information with them. With that, I will turn things over to Dr. Grossman and we look forward to seeing questions in the chat uh, an opportunity to do a bit of dialogue with him at the end of this session. And then also at the August event, there'll be a, a session in which you can gather uh, input from others in your communities and in your states to be able to have a dialogue with Dr. Grossman at that event in August. So take it away. Thanks very much. All right, thank you so much, Nancy. Uh... And Lexi, I think you got to give me control of the screen. There we go. Okay. All right. So uh, I'm going to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, how we changed our approach to managing kids with neonatal absence syndrome, also called NOWS, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, or really um, opioid exposed infants, substance exposed infants. Um, get this to advance, which would be helpful. Okay. 
said nothing to disclose. So, so uh, everyone here knows obviously that the, uh, the problem with opioids in the United States. So not a lot of information here, but this is something that was somewhat um, caused by, or at least certainly added to by the uh, medical community. Uh, prescriptions grew fourfold over the last decade. Uh, there was enough for everyone to have uh, at least one pres one opioid prescription per year. And so if you didn't get one, somebody else got it. Um, in Connecticut, uh, the leading cause of death of, of accidental death uh, has been car accidents forever, as it's been in most places. Um, there were three times as many opioid deaths in Connecticut uh, in the last few years as car accident deaths. Um, the incident, so where we really see this most often in kids is, is with um, opioid exposed infants who, who go through withdrawal when they're born. And that, that has really gone up about sevenfold from 2000, 2016. It's, it seems to be leveling off, but it's leveling off at a very high level. So this is a major issue, um, as all of you know and have experienced. And there was a time, if we showed a graph uh, from the 2000s of what parts of the country were affected, you could see areas of the country that really weren't affected by this very much. You can't, you don't have that map anymore. Uh, this is a, this article describes uh, what a burden this has been on ICUs, neonatal ICUs around the country. Um, this is a 2012 study that saw about 4% of ICU beds uh, were filled with babies going through withdrawal. And in a lot of community hospitals and areas of the country, that number is more like 50%. And certainly what we've seen in Connecticut in, uh, in, in certain, certain of our community NICUs, it's 50%. Uh, and New England has been at the forefront of this. We've had lots of, uh, lots of uh, opioid issues in New England and in, uh, have only recently been surpassed by uh, West Virginia, Tennessee, but it's really a, a, an issue everywhere. So it's really something, there's lots more of these kids. They're taking up lots of space in the ICUs. They, have, they really have the longest length of stay of anything in pediatrics outside of prematurity. Kids with terrible pneumonias who are in the hospital for a long time, they don't match the length of stay of kids going through withdrawal. Uh, the average length of stay has been dropping, but it uh, is dropping from a, a level of about three weeks and down to maybe about two and a half weeks now. Uh, so what happens to the baby? So if, the, if the, the mom is using opioids, doesn't matter what kind, whether they're prescribed or not, methadone or, or heroin or, or suboxone, um, the baby... Uh, the, the fetus gets whatever whatever the mom's taking. So um, most of the action seems to be in a part of the brain called the locus ceruleus. And basically, um, the, the, the fetus getting all these opioids, the brain, it changes the brain. And so the brain has to upregulate all these receptors to keep a level of homeostasis. And once, uh, once the baby's born, they no longer are getting that opioid and they get, they have all these extra receptors. They get a surge of norepinephrine. And that's, that seems to be the, the main thing driving the withdrawal signs, which are fairly similar to, um, to what you would see in adults, but just sort of the, the, the baby version of them. Um, this is not a new problem. There's stuff in the literature from the late 1800s about this um, when heroin was a great cough medicine. Um, and, and there was actually quite a bit of mortality in the, in the case reports as you go through the early 1900s. Uh, in the 1960s is where methadone uh, treatment came in. And then around the, in the 70s is where there started to be more focus on how to manage these babies, which is one of the reasons they were in the ICU, because there was a mortality rate for these. And, and in the mid-1970s, the care of these babies was standardized. There was a heroin epidemic in Philadelphia and so in the NICU in, in Philadelphia, they were getting loads of these babies and they, needed, they were being overwhelmed by them. So they needed to figure out that, how to manage them better. And so, uh, they, used, so you, they came up with this tool called the Finnegan tool, uh, which has been in the, uh, about 10 years ago, there was a survey and about 95% of places in the country were using this, or if they weren't, they were using a, 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 an offshoot of it. And that's what you saw most around the world as well. And so th th this was a, uh, w when they first put this in, this was, this was a, a bit of a game changer and they were able to, to standardize the care and able to reduce the length of stay a little bit. Um, and they, it's a pretty exhaustive listing of all the signs of withdrawal. Um, and they come in different areas, central nervous system disturbances, uh, high-pitched cry. These, 
the general picture of a baby going through this is, is think about a, a colicky baby and then multiply it times five. So it's kind of the most miserable babies you're going to see. They have this terrible cry. They're, they're hard to calm down. They have difficulty sleeping. They have difficulty eating. Um, they are, they have tremors. They are, um, they have a hard time, uh, just controlling the state they're in. They have increased muscle tone. Um, there'll be metabolic and respiratory things. They'll be breathing faster. They'll be sneezing and yawning. Um, they'll, uh, they'll also have gastrointestinal things like feeding difficulties, loose stools. And my favorite is excessive sucking. I don't know what a normal amount of sucking is, but I guess this is more. And so uh, the way this tool was used is they, they, they were each given a score, each of these um, signs and symptoms, uh, and it was, wasn't terribly scientific. The things that seemed worse got a higher point value. So if you had, um, if you had uh, uh, seizures, you got a three, and if you had nasal stuffiness, you got a one. So it, you know, there wasn't much to it other than things that seemed worse. Uh, and w the way this was used is you would add up all the scores, you would, you, would, you would measure these scores somewhere between every two and six hours usually. And if you got three scores of eight in a row, then you would start medication. And that was basically how care for these infants happened since the mid 1970s. Uh, and, and very much is how it happens today. There's some variation, but it's really around that theme. This, this tool using those scores of eight or above, not very difficult. A lot of the research has been trying to figure out when you do start these medications, what the right medication to use is or the right um, combination of medications. And so there's lots and lots of research on that over the years. Um, and at Yale, uh, we, we went through most of these medications. So I'm just going to mostly take you through our story at Yale now. So um, in the, in the early eighties, we were using this medication, which is called paragoric, which uh, doesn't look like something you should give to a baby. Um, but you know, what are you going to do? So this is basically tincture of opium. Tincture of opium means it's 30% alcohol, but they also mix in a couple other carcinogenics. So I'm not entirely sure why this was the choice at the time that got switched over to just regular tincture of opium. And the study I listed at the bottom is kind of the type of study you'll see. This is a comparison of tincture of opium versus morphine for treatment. And most of what the studies are trying to figure out is how do we lower the length of stay or the length of treatment? And so this was a comparison of those two things that found no real difference between tincture of opium and morphine. And so at Yale, we actually, in the mid nineties, we switched to morphine from tincture of opium really just because our pharmacy stopped carrying tincture of opium. Um, what you'll find in the, in the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for this is that um, they, they recommend using a like medication. So in other words, if you're withdrawing from an opioid, you give back an opioid. Uh, so there are some institutions still who will use uh, phenobarbital, which is usually a, a seizure medication. It really acts as a sedative. Uh, and, and this was a comparison from Scotland of morphine versus phenobarbital and found a lower length of treatment for the morphine group. Now, uh, phenobarbital is used uh, quite frequently, um, and it is uh, usually used in addition to the to the opioid. And and what most places will do is you'll 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 treat with morphine or one of the other opioids. And if you max out on your dose, you'll add on another medication, and that's often phenobarbital. What they did in this study, um, this is from Brown, is instead of doing that from right from the beginning, they gave they gave they randomized the groups and they gave half of them uh, tincture of opium and phenobarbital and the other half uh, just got tincture of opium and they followed them for their length of stay. And the length of stay for the group that got phenobarbital from the start was half that of the other group. So a really powerful study. In fact, there's, um, there's uh, these review articles called these called Cochrane Review, uh, which, which will pick a topic and they'll do a review and then give recommendations at the end. And every one of them I've read, the, the recommendation at the end is we need more studies. And the only one that I've read that doesn't say that was the one on NAS, which said, based on this study, this is what everyone should be doing. Again, the length of stay was half in the group that got phenobarbital. Um, so other groups have started to look at methadone um, instead of morphine. Methadone's a little bit longer acting. You don't have to give it quite as often. Uh, and this was a study from Maine, uh, which is a, a rare thing to get to say. There's not a lot of people in Maine, but there is a lot of opioids. So they had plenty of babies to look at. So they compared, uh, gave half the group morphine and half the group, group methadone and found a lower length of stay for the group that got methadone. 
at, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and this is right around when I was starting this. They actually first reported this data in 2006 was the year that I graduated from my residency. And what they did, uh, kind of like the Brown study, they gave half the group got tincture of opium and half the group got tincture of opium plus clonidine. What clonidine can do is actually block the release of norepinephrine. Um, so it can, uh, it, it's something that's used in adults uh, for, to control withdrawal symptoms a little bit as well. Um, so they found a lower uh, a median length of stay for the group that, that in the clonidine group. Uh, and so we actually started using that at, at Yale. So we had been using morphine and then we added morphine and clonidine. And, uh, and, that, and that's around when I started, it was 2006. And so uh, what, what the general standard approach to care, and this is, none of this is terribly complicated, but the standard approach to care was really had five features to it. One, medications were the key to treatment. Once the withdrawal got bad enough, you gave medications and that helped manage it. Um, most of these babies, there is some variation with where babies were managed, but most of them are in neonatal intensive care units. I, uh, you, if you have a doctor talk to you about this, it's very unusual for them not to be a neonatologist. And I am not a neonatologist. I am a pediatric hospitalist. So we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so most, there is some, some uh, babies are cared for in, in sort of a well nursery, some on, on inpatient units, uh, and most in NICUs and some even at home with medications. And many have a combination of some of those, but NICUs are kind of the mainstay of it. Um, Treatment was driven by these Finnegan scores, uh, or or perhaps an offshoot of them. Uh, there's been lots of studies that have that have tried to simplify that scoring tool because it's pretty long, and have gotten exactly the same results as the Finnegan tool. Uh, but nobody seems to use those. It's pretty much this is a Finnegan is is kind of felt like it's sort of like the law, and that's how, how you do it. So you just follow the scores. You use three scores of eight, uh, and and that's kind of it. And then once you do start the medication, you go down uh, by a very small amount. Uh, it, it's a long weaning process. So usually it's 10% of the original dose either every day or every other day. Uh, and so if you do the math on that, uh, you, your length of stays can, has to be pretty long. And then the other part of this, and this is one of the features if you've ever been in a, a neonatal intensive care unit, is that the nurses really uh, really own the babies. They really take care of them. Uh, they, they don't, if you, if you have a baby at an intensive care unit, the nurses who come in, they always have the same babies. They sort of feel responsible for them. And it's one of the, it's one of the really benefits of, of uh, NICU care is that kind of ownership from the nurses, but the parents aren't usually very involved. So that's generally what you'll see at most, the, the standard approach since the 1970s is, is, is that uh, there's some, again, variations around the medications, um, some variation around the NICU and not much else. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. And at Yale, we did basically the same idea the, the one feature we had is we, our NICU uh, didn't have enough beds. So they were always looking for babies that they could send to the general inpatient unit. So uh, this was one of those populations because they were going to stay, our average length of stay was about four weeks. And so if we, if we, if we kept having these babies stay four weeks, we weren't going to have enough beds. So what we would do is when a baby was born, they would be taken from the delivery room right to the NICU and they would be monitored using the Finnegan scores uh, they would be started on medication, and usually about a week or 10 days afterwards, once they felt like they had stabilized the morphine dose, they would transfer the baby up to the general inpatient unit or where a hospice would take care of them. And, and, um, and we really only started our hospice program a year before I got there. So, so I ended up caring for, for these babies at that point. And then, but we had a protocol that followed all this stuff. So we would go down, once the, we would go down, uh, we would do the Finnegan scores on the floor. and um, our, we would decrease the, the medication by 10% every other day, as long as the Finnegan scores were all below eight during that time. If they were, if you had three scores above eight, you would go up on the medication. If you had some scores of eight, you would hold steady. And so again, we had a, we had a, a one month length of stay for these babies and the staff still cared for the baby. We, the inpatient units, you, you could room in. That's what most other parents did, but we had very few. I remember there were two families in, in the first three years that actually roomed in. So uh, it was very unusual. So it's still the same model otherwise. So that's how we were doing things. Okay, so uh, we'll take a, everyone's been sitting here for a few minutes. We're going to do a little game here uh, to start. So um, this, is, this is built for Zoom. So you can do this right on your screen. So there are nine dots here. What I want you to do is connect the nine dots using four lines without taking your finger off of the screen. So four lines, don't take your finger off the screen. I'll give you about 30 seconds.
And if you know how to do it, obviously, you just sort of look smug and feel like you can try to pretend like you just figured it out. All right, everybody got it? Okay, here's how you do it. So in order to do this, you actually have to uh, think outside the box. And this is actually where that saying comes from, think outside the box. I, I think we actually, most of us have been misusing it. I certainly has ha, uh, had been. Um, I always thought of it as, as everybody's thinking about, you know, uh, what, what number this should be. And you actually say, no, no, it should be purple. And, uh, and it's really thinking about it totally, totally differently. It's actually not. If you look at this, um, the, the reason if you had trouble with this is because uh, you created a box in your mind. And if you look at this again, there is no box. It's just nine dots. So the box that you created was in your mind and you created this rule that this was a box in your own mind. It wasn't actually one of the rules. And so thinking outside the box is actually realizing that there isn't a box that is created in our own minds. So that's, uh, so that's important. This is sort of how we started to think about this idea, was trying to realize where there wasn't a box. And it was just in our minds. So uh, this was, again, so I started in 2006, uh, and I uh, ended up, uh, we had two units on, at Yale. We had an infant toddler unit and a school age unit. And there was a hospital who had been there a year longer, and he got to choose which unit he wanted to be on. And he chose the school age unit. Uh, and the two reasons were that he didn't want to take care of these babies and that he liked teenagers. And only one of those is believable because who likes teenagers? <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so I ended up on the infant toddler unit and whenever these babies would get transferred up to NICU, they were put on my service. And so I would care for them. They were uh, fairly easy to care for. We had a, um, we had a protocol and we would follow them. We would, we would used to round, uh, we didn't do family centered rounds at that time. We would sit around a table and talk about the patients. And these were very quick because you would go through the Finnegan scores and whether they had gained or lost weight and whether we were gonna go up, down on the meds or stay the same, and that was it. You never really had to see the patient. We, we did for billing reasons, but that wasn't gonna affect anything. So everything came from the score. Uh, and we would go down by these really slow amounts. And so it, this was a, not a population I was interested in. Uh, we had a protocol. I was learning, you know, I was new on the job, so I was learning how to do other things. And so this was just something that was kind of annoying because they were there forever. And as a hospital, we're usually trying to get people in and out of the hospital as quickly as we can. Um, so, uh, but one of the things that happened is that we were, you'd see these babies who would be doing fine and we would have gone down on their medication by this really small amount the day before, and they were still totally fine the next day. And so our protocol said we were supposed to wait a whole other day to go down by another tiny amount. So we would just, we just kind of fudged that part of the protocol. We didn't tell anybody this protocol came from uh, the, the, the experienced people in the NICU had been there for, for 25 years. Uh, and so we just, we didn't say anything. We just sort of fudged it. And um, I don't know where this data came from, but one of, uh, one of our, our residents had been, uh, was now working at Middlesex Hospital, which was uh, about 30 minutes up the road in Connecticut. Um, and they, uh, they had, uh, their length of stay for these kids was about six weeks. And so he had looked at this data and saw that we had reduced our length of stay from four weeks, from 28 days to 22 and a half days, which is an enormous decrease in length of stay. If you find that in any other, um, in, in any other disease process, that's like a miracle. Uh, and we weren't really even trying. We just kind of ignored the protocol a little bit. And so they asked me to come and give a talk. Um, and uh, we're supposed to say yes when people ask us that. I didn't have, I, I didn't know anything. Uh, really, I had our protocol, uh, and I had—I I knew what the, my predecessor used to uh, take the Finnegan scores uh, for the resident team and take those scores and play the lottery for the team at the end of the week, just to kind of keep it interesting. So basically, I had uh, our protocol, and I had that story, and that was about it. So I had to go and read all of those papers that I mentioned before, uh, and that's where I, I, I found something that, to me, that didn't make any sense, and it was sort of where we started to make our changes. Um, so if we, if we, I'm going to just run through those medication studies again, real quick that I had mentioned on the previous slides, uh, DTO is diluted tincture of opium. So that's the tincture of opium. So this is a study from Johns Hopkins, tincture of opium versus tincture of opium plus clonidine, 17 days versus 12 days. 
morphine versus phenobarbital, it was eight days versus 12 days for length of treatment. Morphine versus tincture of opium, this is the one from Scotland, 30 days versus 27 days. And this was that great one from Brown that was the, uh, the length of stay was half, but the length of stay was 79 days versus 38 days. Uh, and then methadone versus morphine was 17 days versus 24 days. These papers are still coming out. In fact, uh, a couple of years ago, the New England Journal of Medicine uh, published one of these papers comparing morphine versus buprenorphine as a treatment for the babies. And the length of stay for the morphine group was 33 days and for the buprenorphine group was 21 days. Now, um, as I mentioned, the, the treatment uh, is, is really based on the Finnegan scores, but everybody's uh, treatment protocol, and I'm sure if anyone has seen them, they all, the first line treatment is always non-pharmacologic care. And everybody says they do non-pharmacologic care, and then you use the Finnegan score and see what happens. Now, all of these babies are newborn babies. They have very similar past medical histories. They, they've all been opioid exposed. The opioid may be a little bit different, but basically they're the same. The protocols uh, around the country are essentially the same. They're pretty much that standard thing. You're supposed to do non-pharmacologic care, you do your Finnegan scoring, and then the difference here was using uh, a different kind of medication. But if you look across these studies at the tincture of opium at these different institutions, the length of stay ranges from 17 days to 79 days. And if you look at morphine, it ranges from eight days to 30 days. If we include the recent New England Journal study, it's 33 days. That is a tremendous spread in length of stay. Uh, you do there is no other disorder where you can find anything like this. This does not make sense. And so when we thought about it, we said, okay, well, why is this happening? Uh, the answer was that we didn't know, but it didn't seem to make any sense. It didn't seem right. And it made us think that maybe it wasn't about the medications. And so if you go to the American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, they will say uh, that the first line treatment is non-pharmacologic intervention. And that is things like holding the baby, uh, swaddling, feeding the baby on demand, um, swaying, doing kind of the normal, really intensive version of normal uh, baby care. So the American Academy of Pediatrics lists that first and spends 56 words on it. And then the second line treatment, of course, is uh, medications, and they spend 1,652 words on that. So uh, what's going on here? So uh, if even though the first line treatment is supposed to be non-pharmacologic interventions, that does not feel like a very doctory thing to do to say that you're just going to hold the baby and bounce them and that's an intervention. Uh, these are these are intensive care doctors. These are people who are putting people, they're intubating people, they're putting people on ECMO and these really amazing life-saving things and saving these impossibly small babies. And so the idea that they're going to bounce the baby and that's a treatment, it does, doesn't sound like a real thing. And if you go back and look at those studies, even though they list the first line treatment as non-pharmacologic interventions, most of them don't say anything about it. So you don't even know what they did. You don't know if, which moms were at the bedside and which weren't. Um, and so that would be totally unacceptable in any other situation. So if you were, if you were to reverse that, let's say you wanted to study swaddling. And you said, okay, we're going to swaddle half the kids and we're not going to swaddle the other half. And then you just said, I don't know, some of the kids got morphine. I don't know which ones or how much, uh, but it's not a big deal. Uh, the people, nobody would publish that. They would just laugh at you. But because it was non-pharmacologic stuff, not a big deal, not a real thing. So what we did is um, we started what I think is the least uh, innovative quality improvement project is we just said, well, let's just take the guidelines at their word and actually do this stuff. So when we started from 2003 to 2010, we had about 150 uh, NAS babies. And we had, obviously, like everyone else, our numbers went way up around that time. Uh, and of those 150, 148 had been treated with morphine. So they'd all gone to the NICU. They'd all been scored on the Finnegan score. And all of them had got scores greater than eight other than two of them. So, uh, and our length of stay uh, for these infants. And now, I'm, this, is a, this is a control chart. So this is a quality improvement project. Just to orient you to what this chart is, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to this a few times as we go along. Uh, each yellow dot, so the, the x-axis is um, along the bottom is the date. And so here it's from 2008, 2010, we're gonna go further along. And then on the left side is the length of stay. So each yellow dot is an individual patient and how long they stayed in the hospital. The, um, the, the black line here is our average length of stay, which was at 22 and a half days. 
And the green line was sort of, I guess, a goal. This is what, uh, there was a major uh, multi-centered study to improve and decrease the length of stay uh, for these babies, which came out a few years ago by the Vermont Oxford Network, which is a, a network of about a, of over a thousand uh, NICUs, uh, including all the biggest ones, where they worked to decrease their length of stay. And they decreased their length of stay around um, the country from, from uh, 21 days to 19 days, uh, which is an enormous change. So if you have a two-day length of stay over the, that many institutions, that's an enormous change and a really big deal. So that would that's sort of our, our, our benchmark of an, a successful project. Uh, and then uh, the red lines are our are, are, are control limits. So this are, these are three standard deviations from the mean, which basically means uh, the point of this is you could predict that the next point is going to drop is a 99% chance of falling between the two red lines, which as you can see is not that helpful here. That What that tells you is the next point, the next baby who's born is going to stay somewhere between zero and 47 days in the hospital. So not that helpful. So what we try to do with a quality improvement project is we want both that the our, our mean line, our average line to go down, so our average length to stay drops, and also the process becomes more predictable, so those red lines become closer together, so we have a little more prediction. So really our goal with this, and this is important, was not to reduce length of stay. Our thought with this is this was not going well for babies or for moms. And so what we wanted to do is have this experience go better for the babies and the moms and to set them up for success when they went home. And we did, we did our, if you, what we published is certainly that we were trying to reduce length of stay, but that's really a side effect of this. So I'll get into it. So how did we do this? So we did look at how other places had done this. And, and there's particularly one that was published in 2015 um, out of Ohio State, and, and nobody does quality improvement in, in pediatrics any better than the folks in Ohio at Cincinnati and Ohio State. They are the gurus of this. That's where we have sent all of our people at Yale and, and Children's Hospital to do their quality training have all gone to Cincinnati, including me. So they are the best at this. Um, but what, what, and so what they have done a lot of work on this as well, and they have, uh, this study showed they reduced the length of stay from about 33 days to to about 20 days, uh, which was a really dramatic change. Uh, but what, what this made me think of was, uh, this, is, this is a uh, sailboat that was built around the turn of the 20th century, so in the early 1900s, and it's an oil tanker. So it is also the only seven-masted sailboat ever built. I'm not a sailor, but this is, I, thought, I found this interesting. So it's the only seven-masted sailboat ever built. And so that, uh, my first thought is, wow, but then you really know why was it the only one ever built. So um, this was around the time where steamships were really, uh, became much easier to build and were really taking the place of sailboats. So if you were a sailboat maker, you had uh, two choices. You could try to really push the sailboat technology as far as it would go, add extra masses for, mass for more power, or you could switch your paradigm and relook at the whole thing and switch over to steamships. And so this was a group where they, they tried to do it um, with the sailboats and uh, a couple things. First of all, uh, the masts ended up, it, it takes up more space. So you couldn't fit as much oil. And it also became much harder to control. It only lasted about three or four months before it ran aground. And that was the end of the seven masted sailboat. So what we looked at is, that, uh, is it, it, maybe we aren't doing this the right way at all. And we have to totally rethink how we're doing it instead of trying to build on what we're already doing. And so we tried to, what we really wanted to do is step back and say, does this make sense? And so we took this one by one. We took it the five pillars of what we were doing. So, so okay, medication. So the medications are the key to treatment. In fact, some places you don't get a diagnosis of NAS unless you get medication, uh, which really doesn't make any sense. So um, what, we, what we looked at, somebody had, uh, had, had figured this out and looked at this at uh, Dr. Abraham up in Vancouver. He had done this wild thing where he had taken a baby and a mom and he put them together, uh, which was one of those ideas that's just crazy enough to work. And so it turned out that outcomes were better for both the baby and the mom, which seems quite surprising, the idea that, um, that you would put a baby and a mom together. And uh, when, I ex you know, when, I, uh, when I explained this whole project that we had done to, to my brother, he said, so, so basically you proved that babies like their moms. Is that, is that the whole thing? And that's pretty much it. So you're going to find there's a, there's a lack of uh, eureka science moments in this. This is all just stepping back and undoing things that didn't make sense. So we thought gosh, that seems to make sense, and kind of went along with what we had been seeing. We would see that if the 
Uh, mom had stayed for four nights in a row. The baby was doing great and had low scores. And then one night she couldn't stay. And then the baby had higher scores. And so we got in the morning, if we followed our protocol, we'd say, well, the baby had three scores of eight. So we're supposed to give the kid uh, medication. But then we had to say, okay, does this, does this baby need more medication or more mom? And we started to think, well, maybe the baby needs more mom. Um, so we started to really focus on this non-pharmacologic care. Now, we were just doing this on our inpatient unit. The folks in the NICU didn't know what we were doing at all. But we just said, we're going really, to really do this non-pharmacologic care. We're going to focus on having uh, the parents present and really controlling the environment. And so uh, things that we were able to do, since we had... Uh, we were able to, to keep, keep it a low stimulation environment. We were able to feed the babies on demand, which sounds like a crazy thing. If any of you have, so what normally happens in the hospital with these babies is uh, they're on a feeding schedule, which means they eat every three hours or sometimes every four hours. And so if the baby is hungry at two hours, the response is that the baby is not due to eat yet. Uh, now, if you, if any of you in the audience have had a baby before or have met a baby before or have met a hungry baby before, that is a crazy statement. So usually, and now stop me if this sounds crazy, if you have a hungry baby, one of the normal responses to that is to feed the baby. And so that is not something that we do in medicine. So we are, uh, that, is, uh, that is a challenging thing to do. Uh, it actually is a challenging thing to do because if you are a nurse and you're caring for these babies, uh, and you are supposed to, and these, some of these babies are hungry every 45 minutes. And so you got a job to do. You have four other patients to take care of and give them medications, do all these other things. You can't be feeding a baby every 45 minutes. Uh, but who can? Well, somebody who's staying at the bedside. So usually the mom. It's not always the mom. And I'm going to say mom, but it's, it's sometimes we've had single dads doing this. And it's sometimes it's, it's the, a lot of times it's sort of the taking a village kind of thing where it's, where it's mom, it's dad, it's grandma, it's whoever we can get there who's going who's gonna to take care of the baby. So what we found is, uh, if you look at this at this uh, graph, you can see that the average length of stay went from 22 and a half days to 13 days, which was about the lowest length of stay that you could find from anything published. Um, and that was just by really doing this non-pharmacologic care aggressively and just saying, this is a real treatment. And what we found, uh, and, and you can also see the red lines of them closer together as well. So, um, so how did we... What we looked at with this, the thing that was really different that we uh, that was hard for us to do was 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 to was to feed the kid whenever they were hungry and also to respond uh, the moment they started to get irritable. So what happens a lot of times with babies going through with this withdrawal, they may be calm and then they start to get a little irritated, they start to cry, and then all of the withdrawal symptoms snowball. And so sometimes if you can respond within a few seconds, you can short circuit that and you can comfort the baby and calm them down. And so you can't do that if you're not right at the bedside. And so those were two major things that you couldn't do unless you were a parent or somebody staying at the bedside. So the way we looked at this was, is that by having the parent there, uh, that reduced the length of stay by almost 10 days. Now, if that were a medication, uh, everyone would be using it. There would be no questions. That would be a miracle medication. Uh, if, I, uh, if I had invented it, I would be on a beach somewhere instead of in my dining room. Um, and so, but, but that's not, it was just mom. And so what we did with that is we said, okay, well, let's just think of mom as medication. In other words, let's just say, okay, if this were a kid with pneumonia, uh, and we had uh, then, then basically mom is the antibiotics for this. And so that made us think about where we were taking care of these kids. And we were caring for these kids in an intensive care unit. And so why were we doing that? And so again, all we, kept, all we did with this was ask why we were doing what we were doing. And what we found out the answer was that every one of these questions was the same. The reason we were doing what we were doing today is because that's what we were doing yesterday. That's it. And we started to uncover where it came from, there was really nothing to it. So this wasn't a standard approach. This was a traditional approach. It's just the way we've always done it. And when you try to uncover where this information came from, why do they have to be in NICUs? There's nothing. There's no data on that. So we started to think about, okay, um, what are the reasons they need to be in intensive care units? These babies don't need, um, they, they don't need uh, to be 
breathing support. They don't need to be intubated in any way. They don't need central lines or things that you do in intensive care unit. They need to be held a lot. So what about this says they should be in intensive care unit? Uh, and there really isn't anything. What you'll hear sometimes is that, well, they might have seizures. And so when people say that, they will cite a study from 1972 that says that 2 to 11% of these babies uh, might have seizures. Uh, one of the authors of that pa paper was actually uh, in our health system. We asked him about it. And he said, well, we weren't really sure about uh, if those were really seizures. So uh, I know <laughs> there hasn't been any really follow-up uh, showing that, and which is not a surprise. It's not, uh, opioid withdrawal is not associated with seizures in, in any other age group. Um, and, and even if it were, um, we don't usually put people in intensive care units because they might have seizures. That's like what epilepsy is. And, and in fact, if you went home and had a seizure, you wouldn't come to our intensive care unit to go to our neurology unit. So it didn't, that didn't make any sense, even if it was true. Uh, and here, could there be something negative about being in a NICU? And the answer, of course, is yes. NICUs are great. This is uh, from our website photo. And one thing you can see is it's, uh, it's, uh, it's bright, it's bustling. There's a lot of people around. Now you don't see any parents around because everybody's working and they're rounding. So parents aren't allowed in there when you're rounding. It's also 12 babies to a room. Um, and so this is me actually sneaking in and uh, taking a, a, an actual picture of it. And you can see how welcoming it is for a family. You can look over on the right. You can see that rolly chair with the, with the uh, tape on the arm. Uh, that's where the, the parent can sit, uh, but not, not a very welcoming place. And basically, if you think of the things we were doing non-pharmacologically, really trying to create a low stimulation environment, holding the baby, feeding them on demand, they can't do any of these things in the NICU. These are, this is, if you wanted to provide a, a place where you can provide almost none other than swaddling, none of the non-pharmacologic care, this is your place. So that's the first line treatment. And there's no parents there. The parents are not, um, are not, uh, they're not really welcome to stay. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is like taking a kid with pneumonia and putting them in a unit that doesn't have antibiotics. That sounds crazy. Who would ever do that? It's what we were doing with these kids. So on our inpatient unit, it's not that nice, but we do have, uh, you can control the environment. There's a place for at least one family member to stay. It's either single or double rooms, but there's always a place for somebody to stay. And so um, what we said is, okay, we think mom is medicine. And this is, there's really three major themes to what, we're, what, what we figured out are the really important things. And that's the first one. Mom is medicine. So do what you would do. It, you would never put a, a baby in a place where you, they couldn't have the medicine they needed. And mom is that medicine. So that is the first pillar of what we did. So, so we said, okay, the mom and baby have to stay together. So the babies should first go to the newborn nursery with their moms. And so instead of going to uh, right away to the NICU, we had them staying with their moms in the nursery. It only took 18 months of negotiating with our nursing staff up there because nobody, no, nobody really enjoyed taking care of these, these patients. And I'll, I'll get to that more a little bit later. Um, this was not a popular uh, patient group. And so, um, so we eventually got them to do it. And, and what was interesting is the, the idea was if, if there was another medical problem, the folks in the newborn nursery could send the babies to the NICU. And the first six patients who came by with, uh, with NAS all got transferred to the NICU with another medical problem that, that uh, miraculously resolved upon arriving in the NICU. Uh, and I will circle back to the, um, to the nursery because the stuff that's happened since then has really been amazing. So we, so the idea was we were going to keep these babies with their moms. They were going to go to the NICU. They weren't going to go to the NICU. They were going to go to the general inpatient unit uh, after they had gone to the nursery. So it, once the mom was discharged, the mom and baby would move down to the general inpatient unit. So the idea was mom and baby need to stay together. Um, and so that's what we did. Okay. So by doing that, we saw we actually decreased the length of stay even more. We're down to 10 days. Now you will notice there's a couple of really long lengths of stay there. And actually the red lines got further away. And what we found when we looked at that is that there were, it was a, it was a time of very low census in our neonatal intensive care unit. And um, because of that, um, th when, they, when the NICU got a baby, with NAS, they kept them through the whole hospitalization. And they didn't really know that we were doing anything differently. They were just following the same protocol. We, we hadn't changed the protocol. We were just starting to ignore it, and we hadn't told them about it. So that's what happened in that area. But still, overall, the average length of stay was lower. 
So then we started to look at, we were on a roll. So we started to look at the Finnegan scores, which is really how everybody manages this. And uh, again, so there's, when you have a score like this, there can be things that seem sort of ridiculous. And so you could have uh, a baby who had two scores of eight, and now they have a score of seven, and they have sneezed three times in the last uh, couple of hours or indeterminate period of time. And then they sneeze a fourth time, which of course is the most important sneeze. Now they get a score of eight, and now you have to give them a dose of morphine, except you don't give them a dose of morphine. You have to give them at least a hundred doses of morphine because you have to start on that weaning protocol. So they're going to get morphine every, every eight, three hours. So you're going to get eight doses a day. You're going to stabilize the dose for a few days. And then if everything goes perfectly, you'll go down by 10% every day. So you're buying at least a hundred doses. Um, and that's for that extra sneeze. And so there are some problems with this scoring tool. Um, so, so, and, and one of the other things that's always interesting is, is I, there's not a lot of clinicians here, but when you start to ask, well, where did everyone uses a score of eight and where did that come from? And was anybody uh, in the room when that happened? And usually there isn't. And so I finally figured out where eight comes from. And it comes from the original 1975 paper. It said an infant with a score of seven or less was not treated with drugs for the absence syndrome because in our experience, he would recover rapidly with swaddling and demand feedings. Infants whose score was eight or above were treated pharmacologically. So it's just eight because that's what they chose in 1975. Never been studied or challenged since. It's just what everybody uses because that's the way we did it yesterday. So there are some problems with this scoring tool. One, uh, it has led to the longest lengths of stay of anything in pediatrics and lots of medications. Of, and we're not sure how safe they are. And the more information we get, the more we're learning that maybe these are not safe medications for, for babies in terms of development. The whole purpose of the treatment is to get the scores below this threshold number. You don't need to see the baby. You just need to, if you could see one less sneeze, they could have one less sneeze. Or even if you could just see one less sneeze, that's good enough. Then you, then you don't need to score. You don't actually need to see the baby. You don't even know how the baby is doing. Um, and then here's one of the things that's interesting. So when we were doing this and coming up with this, I, that's when I had my firstborn uh, child who's now a, a delightful 10-year-old, but was a really miserable baby. And he had uh, a bunch of these signs uh, uh, that are on the Finnegan tool, but there's three of them that he didn't have. And these are the three that are most specific for withdrawal. Uh, one was having a hyperactive startle reflex. So you may remember that if you had your own babies, that's where the, you kind of startle a baby and their, their arms go up. They have very dramatic uh, startle reflexes or moral reflexes. Uh, these babies will have increased tone. So they will, be, they will appear strong. So if you lift a, a, a baby up, uh, a baby not going through a draw by, by the arms, their heads will lag way back because uh, their baby's heads are huge compared to their body. If you pull up a baby going through withdrawal uh, by their arms, they come up like a board. Um, and so this, this is increased, their muscles are kind of always contracted. And then they will also have tremors. Uh, and other babies will have tremors, but you, they, are, um, they, they are usually for other reasons that are easily reversible. So those three things are uh, key, and it, it, particularly tremors when you disturb them. So, um, so here's the thing about that. How do you know if a baby has a exaggerated startle reflex or, um, or tremors when you disturb them? You, there's no secret way. You actually have to disturb them. You have to get them to withdraw. So the whole purpose of the treatment is to try to keep the baby calm. Uh, and so in order to do this scoring tool, which you're doing every two to six hours, you have to see if you can get them to do stuff. So I would contend this, this is a tool that actually does harm to the baby. It's going totally against the treatment. Uh, it can also be slow to respond. So you're doing this, we were at our institution, we were doing this every four hours. So you can have a baby who is totally inconsolable at 10 a.m. And their next score is at, at noon, and they get a score of 10. All right, we're not going to do anything about that. No one even knows about it. They're screaming the whole afternoon. Their next score is at 4 p.m. They get another score of 10, and they're screaming all the way till 8 p.m. And they finally get their third score of 8, and then we intervene. So that's been, that's 14 hours um, where we haven't done anything. So really, really uh, slow to respond. And then it's also, uh, it can be powerful and potentially harmful meds to give to treat a sneeze or a yawn. So you, uh, so sneezes and yawns may be signs of withdrawal, but here's the thing. Um, I don't think we really care about those signs. So, uh, there's no other disorder where we are counting sneezes and yawns and doing some, uh, really potentially harmful medications to treat that. What I found is, uh, I, I've taken care of about 500 kids who have been exposed to methadone, which is the most common thing we see in Connecticut. 
And all of them have had signs of withdrawal. Every one of them has had increased muscle tone. So if I concede that these babies are going through withdrawal, what's the actual utility of counting sneezes and yawns? Uh, there isn't really one. So if we don't really care about that and we know these babies are going through withdrawal, what do we care about? So we said, we're not going to do this scoring tool anymore because it's harmful and it's not telling us what we want to know. We want to know what we thought would be useful is to try to figure out if these babies could act like babies. So thinking, of, thinking could we control the withdrawal signs so that the baby could function like a baby? And now the uh, baby doesn't have a very long list of uh, their job descriptions pretty limited. So there's really three things. So can the baby eat? Can the baby sleep? And can the baby be consoled? So you shouldn't have uh, babies at this age should be consoled. There are babies who get into colic, but that's a little bit later. So that's it. Can they eat? Can they sleep? And can they be consoled? And so if you can do those things as a baby, then we are managing your withdrawal well. Whether you sneeze a bunch of times, it doesn't really matter. But as long as we can get it so you can function okay, then that is a success. So we are managing it well. So uh, as part of a, a health system that is very slow moving, we were uh, able to uh, take, adva take advantage of that for once. So we still had in our bylaws or our whatever our protocols that you had to do the Finnegan scores but we stopped using them. We didn't report them on rounds. We didn't use them for anything for management. We looked at 50 babies that went, came to our inpatient unit over uh, about a year and a half. And we, we still were doing about every four hour Finnegan scores, did not use them to guide management. We didn't, they were just kind of buried in the chart somewhere. And we made all our management decisions using this eat, sleep, console model. So if you were unable to eat, sleep, or be consoled, then we would increase your treatment. That's usually when we use medication. So we looked at the proportion of infants treated with morphine versus the proportion predicted to be treated with morphine using this Finnegan approach. So in other words, how many kids did we give morphine to and versus how many of them had three scores of eight? Because that's what we would have given morphine for. And then we looked at what happened if uh, the next day. So if we didn't give morphine and Finnegan told us to, how'd the kid do the next day? And then uh, we looked at the scores the day after. And so here's what we found. Uh, out of those 50 kids, we only gave six of them uh, morphine. And if we had used Finnegan, we would have given 31 of them. So there was 25 out of the 50 kids who avoided getting morphine uh, using this new approach. Uh, there were 78 days where we gave less morphine than Finnegan told us to. And in those following day, the average score was actually down. The Finnegan score was actually down by about a point and it was down in 70% of the cases. There were two cases where we went the other direction where we had an inconsolable baby whose scores weren't that high. We gave them, so we gave them morphine, even though the Finnegan scores were low. And even despite getting morphine, the Finnegan scores were up by almost two points the next day. There were no readmissions in this study. There were no seizures. There were no ICU transfers. All of these babies did well. So um, this is a picture, this is an actual picture of an NAS baby. And if, I, if you go around institutions and ask what they would do with this baby, you hear some will use, it's a lot of, still about what medication you use. Well, we would use morphine for this baby to try to calm them down. And another place might use methadone. And so that's sort of how we would think about this. And if you ever see a, a news report of, uh, about NAS, you usually see the doctor standing next to the baby who's doing this. Um, and so the, the, the simple question that we would ask is, okay, now what would you do if this wasn't an NAS baby? And again, if you've had children before, um, this is not a difficult answer. If you have a crying baby in front of you, uh, the normal response is to pick the baby up. I told you this wasn't going to be that technical. So, uh, the, so the, remember, the first pillar uh, for what we said we would do is that we would, we would act like the mom is the medication. The second one is that we're going to pretend it's a baby. Do what you would do if it were a baby. And so babies who are crying like this tend to like to be picked up. So that's what we would do. And we would often hear things in the past where you'd have a nurse would come and say, look, I can't put this baby down. Uh, and if I do, they just start crying. And the answer to that is great. It's working. So uh, we started to look at our medication dosing as well. Now, remember, when we started to give medication, we would end up giving 100 doses. So, And we would only go down once a day. And so what is it about the earth rotating that says that's when we go down? It has nothing to do with the half-life of the medication or anything like that. So we said, okay, we were having these situations where we would still have babies who would go to the NICU. And anytime when they went to the NICU where they couldn't do any of this first line non-pharmacologic treatment, they would end up on medication. And then they would get transferred up to our unit, maybe on day five of life. 
And we would say, oh, well, they're on medication. We'll go through this long wean. And then we started to say, well, why are we doing that? Because what we're doing now that they're on the floor is we're increasing the first line treatment. We are, we are doing this aggressively where we weren't before. So if we're going up on that first line treatment, maybe we can come down on the second line treatment. So we started to go down three times a day. And so instead of it taking 10 or 14 days to come off with the morphine, we could get off in three or four days. Even then we said, well, why are we doing that? What we started to notice is some of these babies, they have a tough time of day, or maybe mom was away for a little bit and they had a really tough time. So we would have a situation. Um, well, I'll give you a couple of uh, an example. So it's three o'clock in the afternoon and the baby is screaming and we go into the room. He's inconsolable. We try all of our, non-pharmacologic things. We try to feed the baby. The mom's not there. She went out for a cigarette. We get her back there. She gets back. The baby calms down. Everything's fine. Another scenario, same thing. So that's an idea where the baby was difficult to console. So we, what did we do? We increased the first line treatment. We didn't just give medication. We gave the first line, which is what you would do in any other disorder. Try to, try to increase the first line treatment. So we would do all of those things first. And most of the times that works. Um, now, here's a situation. It's three o'clock. The mom is out. She's not going to be back for a few hours. And the baby's inconsolable. We try everything we can do. We're feeding the baby. We're doing everything. It's not working. So we give a dose of morphine. Next dose is due at six o'clock. The mom is back. The baby is calm in her arms, is now eating well, has been sleeping fine, is consoled. And so we're going to wake the baby up to give him a dose of morphine. What, what exactly would the morphine be for? So what we said is we're just going to give the morphine when we need it. And it turned out instead of giving 100 doses, we were giving one or two doses. And that is there's been a number of follow-up studies would have found the same thing. That's usually one or two doses. There are occasional kids that will need more, but very rare. So we did this. We found that our length of stay now went down to seven days. And now if you look at the red line, so that is the, again, three standard deviations, you would expect 99% of the patients to fall in there. That is actually below. Uh, the the numbers for um, for that Vermont Oxford study of the of the 200 institutions. So what we have done here, as you can see, is we have now built a steamship, and everyone else is doing a sailboat. This is a totally different model, but it's really undoing the model. So um, we were still looking at our model of of you know what we had said initially is that these patients would come to the floor, and we would we now allowed the families to to room in initially. And then we said, no, the, the, having the mom there is really important. We have to really encourage them to room in. But then uh, remember what we had said in the beginning is mom is, is, is the antibiotic. So we don't encourage the pharmacist to bring up the antibiotics. Uh, that is like, a, that has to happen. And so we started to think about that uh, in those terms. And so um, we thought about how we were handling that, how we were treating the moms, um, how, uh, and and there, was a, there was a study that came out from, from Lisa Cleveland in San Antonio where she did a qualitative study, and just interviewed a bunch of moms going through this. And there were, there were four major themes uh, that came out of that. One was that addiction was misunderstood. And in fact, we have repeated this study uh, recently just with our new model, and we found a lot of positive things, but we still found this one, that addiction is misunderstood and that, that uh, the staff doesn't understand what the family is going through. Uh, that the moms feel guilty. We also found this in our group. The moms feel guilty. They know that what they were taking, even if it was prescribed, is causing their baby to go through this. They felt judged by the nursing staff. And if you, there's also been some studies talking to nurses, and uh, they, have found, they have said, yeah, we're judging these moms. If you think about a, a population in the, in the neonatal intensive care unit, it is an innocent population. And so if you think about adult medication, you know, we, we smoke, we eat poorly, we drink too much, we do all these things to cause our health to be lousy. These, there's nobody who did anything wrong in a NICU. You can't blame anybody except for these babies. You can say, well, if the mom wasn't doing that, and what you hear a lot is, well, if she hadn't made those decisions, um, we wouldn't be in this situation. And it makes the nurses angry. And they've said that. And then and what the mom says, they don't trust the nurses because of that. Um, and so there were some really powerful uh, quotes from the moms. His nurse was like, his muscles are locking up because of his junkie mom. I didn't want to visit. I would call before. If that nurse was there, I wouldn't even go. Because we're going to leave and he's going to cry and they're going to leave him crying because they're going to be like, you know what? His parents are jerks. So again, if you have had a baby before, imagine, first of all, visiting your newborn baby and then not being felt 
welcome to visit your baby, to be feeling judged uh, and to, and to be, to have animosity towards you when you're trying to, to see your baby. This was the one that really uh, moved us. It's a long one, but just bear with me. If you're using while you're pregnant, you have a problem, a big problem, and you need help. You obviously don't care about yourself, about anything except the drug. Make it a little bit easier on that mother if she's showing initiative. If she's taking the time to be there, if she loves her child, you can see it and you can feel it. If it's obvious that she's there for the baby, then embrace it. Make it easier. You don't know what her circumstances are. You don't know what she's been through or how hard her life has been. You don't know what she was feeling when she was pregnant, if she was being abused, if she was poor. Whatever the reason she was using while she was pregnant, you just don't know. So try to make it easier for her. So there's certainly studies on, um, on opioid use disorder, some, some with uh, numbers of trauma experienced up at 99%. And so we have been, what we were doing instead of making it easier for these moms and what we still do today is we've made it much harder. This is a vulnerable population who needs our support. And this is why when I said we wanted to make this better, to go better for babies and moms, we've been doing the opposite. Even when we were improving this, we were still making it harder on the moms. They were still feeling judged. They weren't feeling supported. And what we needed, whatever time you're in the hospital, that's a small percentage of the time that this family is going to be taking care of this baby and this is going to be a family. So how do we support them? And how do we make it so they have the best chance for success, not in the hospital, but going forward? And so we realized that our role in this wasn't, there wasn't a lot to do medically anymore. And our real role for this was being coaches and cheerleaders. And that's what we had to do. How do we make it so the mom feels ready and confident to go home? When we started this, it would be 28 days, and we had not seen the family very much. And we would say, hey, uh, your baby's ready to go home tomorrow. And the family would say, oh, my God, we, haven't, we, we don't even have a crib yet. They would gotten to pretend that they didn't have a baby during this time. What happens now is you, um, at, at about five days, you see the mom standing in the doorway with her baby saying, hey, I got this. Can I go home? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. And that's the idea. That's what we're going for. Now, there are times where there is no mom there. And there is a situation which we've all seen where, well, what do you do in this situation where, you know, the mom doesn't want anything to do with the baby or she, there's, she, it's totally no doubt that it's unsafe for that situation? Well, there's a couple things. First of all, it doesn't change what the baby needs. You may really not to be hokey about this and <laughs> Uh, but the treatment for these babies, the major treatment is love. And so somebody needs to love these babies. And that is the main treatment. So if we don't have a, a family there, then we have to do that. If we can't figure out how to do that as a health system, then that's a big problem. And so we use these folks, we use the volunteers. And so we have a group of, of these of these old ladies and, and a couple old old guys who that when they come in, we give them the same rah-rah speech that we give to the family that you have everything, the baby, this is what we tell the moms, that you have everything your baby needs. You are the cure for your baby. Um, and then we don't tell them that they are welcome, that they are uh, allowed to be here or they're encouraged. We say, we really are much more forceful and say, you are the treatment. You have to be there. What can we do to help you? How can we support you so that you or someone in your family can be there all the time? And if, and if there's a time where we can't, then we do it. It's, we, we do, we, it takes a village at that point. We figure out how to do it with all the resources we have in the hospital. The answer is not, oh, well, there's no mom. We're going to keep the kid in the hospital for four weeks and load them up on morphine. That's not, that's not okay. We need to get them to somebody who's going to love them as quickly as possible. If it's a foster family, fine. Let's get them there as soon as we can. So to summarize this old protocol versus new protocol, initially the, whole, the old goal was to suppress withdrawal signs. So all you're trying to do was just get fewer sneezes. New protocol is you have to have the infant function as a normal neonate. Can they function? The old protocol, the NICU, you had a mom visiting the baby. Here, it's mother and child together. And this is a really important thing. And this is, the, this is something that is uh, what you hear a lot. And this is where that idea of those boxes comes in again. You hear a lot at some hospitals, well, we, we, don't, we, we can't have parents room in. Oh, oh, is that right? Well, let's just turn it around. Say you have to have parents room in. Figure it out. And so that's what we found at, some of, at our places in Connecticut. That I said, we, if you go in with that mindset, like, no, no, the mom and child, that is the medication. You need to figure this out. So we've had places where they just have a community NICU and they have figured out how to create a room for these families. We have, we have some com a community hospital in New Haven where they have one room like that that's sometimes available. If it's not, you got to transfer them to a place where they can be together. That is the rule. They must be together. Figure it out. Finnegan scores. You're treating the number. So I just need that number to get below eight. I don't care anything else. I don't even know. I don't have to ask how the baby's doing. 
eat, sleep, console, we treat the infant. You actually have to ask the mom, how's the baby doing? And uh, there's a, uh, I, I was up in uh, Dartmouth, which is a, uh, they really take pride in their non-pharmacologic interventions. They've done an amazing job uh, with families, but for a long time, they were still using the Finnegan scores. And they had a panel of five moms who gave an, uh, for, to talk for an hour about their experience. And the idea was they were going to talk about how, how great the non-pharmacologic stuff was and how supported they were. They talked the entire time, all of them, about the Finnegan scores and how almost traumatic it was because they, were, they knew they knew that well. That nurse at night tends to score higher, and I know if they see one more sneeze, then I'm going to be we're going to be here for two more weeks. So it was really it was really an oppressive system, and there's nobody asking how the baby's doing, and they're and they're focused on the moms identifying all the signs of withdrawal just to make sure they don't forget that the baby's going through this. And it can it, it it's much too granular. It doesn't need to be there. We know the baby's going through withdrawal. The treatments aren't different uh, based on on more sneezes or more yawns. So you really need to say, how is the baby doing and treat the baby as a whole? Everybody says they do supportive care. We're zealots about it. That is the treatment. That is the first line treatment. That is the main way you do this. Uh, feeding on demand. Uh, we, we had to take that. Uh, we had to take any schedule out of it. I, I used to have a full head of hair before this. this is, I, for years going into this, you'd still go, well, they're not due to eat yet. That is not allowed. You can not, never hear that. There is no feeding schedule. Feed the baby when the baby's hungry. That is not an innovative thing. Morphine was the key to our old protocol. Now it shows some, somewhere on page three of our protocol. Uh, it was often a surprise uh, for families. They didn't know what was going to happen when they were born. No one, had, no one had had this conversation. The OBs hadn't talked about it. Um, so we are, we've been working, and when this has fallen, we're, we're, we're reinvigorating this, but preparing the families beforehand. Uh, so we're, we're, we've had a nurse practitioner do it, it was since retired. So we're going to have our hospitals group start meeting with these families before and to go over what's expected, what, what they should expect, and what the role of the mom and the family is in this. The old protocol, the staff takes care of the infant. Now the family takes care of it, and the staff coaches the parents. We would hear things, uh, and the culture change that went through with this was really, was really uh, important because, you know, when I, when I talked to one of our nursing leaders with this, who was, who was a, a, an early adopter uh, and, and understood what we were doing, you know, they, they, they would try not to have the family stay. It was harder on the nursing staff. So they, you know, normally they're trying to make the room nice for the family. They're making the bed and fluffing the pillow. And here they would just sort of throw the sheets on the cot. They wanted the family not to stay. Um, and they weren't treating them the same way they were treating everybody else. And so that became our third pillar. So remember, the first one is mom is the medication. Second one is pretend it's a baby. And the third one is treat the family with the same respect you would anybody else. So instead of uh, the old system where you'd say, like, oh, you know, the, the, the mom uh, was holding the baby and she was nodding off. So I called uh, Child Protective Services. It's saying like, okay, the mom's on methadone and she just gave birth to a baby. Her methadone dose is 30% higher than it should be for somebody who's not pregnant. Uh, and she just gave birth to a baby. So she is going to be tired and she is going to be drowsy. It is not a character flaw. So how do we support her through this instead of saying that it's, she's done something wrong? So we are figuring out this. We are supporting them and trying to coach them and, and let them get some rest and, and to, to troubleshoot how this is going to go at home and how they can handle this and, how, and to support them and to encourage them, uh, the mom, so that they feel uh, that, that we are actually making it easier. So here's, here's where we are, and, and we have had a continue, continuation of this. So this is all those dots are individual patients. This is now... Uh, through the through uh, 2017, uh, we our length of stay has been down to 5.9 days. It remains that way through 2020. Um, we are under six days. We have spread this to other hospitals within our system, to Bridgeport Hospital, whose length of stay is below six days, and now to a community hospital uh, up in New London, Connecticut. Same thing. Their length of stay has gone down to uh, 5.9 days. Um, if you look at the, per I showed this in the beginning, the percent of patients that were treated. Uh, was 98%. And the percent that we now treat is 100% aggressively from birth. We just don't use morphine very often. So our morphine is down between 10 and 20%. It's actually probably a little bit lower than it should be. Uh, I think the, the culture has changed such that uh, both the families and, the, and the, the residents and the staff, they don't really think of morphine as a, as a, as a great treatment for this. 
And so we still try to use it. And, and, it, and the idea is if you're using it the way that we do it, where you're using it as needed, you're not really extending the length of stay. The withdrawal signs tend to peak about the third or fourth day. If you give medication for a long time, you just extend that period out for weeks and weeks and weeks. So if you get over the worst of it on day four and you're getting better, uh, you might need a dose of morphine on day three or day four or two, but it's not, you're still going to be able to go home within the first week. Our, the average dose of morphine, there's been two cases in the last uh, five or six years where we've used more than our starting dose. So we used to go up really high, and now we find that just a little bit goes a long way. Our breastfeeding rates, these are, these are not as successful now, and we don't have the official data, but these have come down a bit because we've made some more stringent rules. I wasn't involved with this around marijuana use, but we had no breastfeeding when we started. We got up above 50%, and we're, we're taking on efforts to get it back up there now. And our cost of care, the, the, uh, this is, this is a, uh, from a public policy perspective, our, the cost of care, and these are almost all Medicaid patients, has gone down by 75%. And so what, what I would say is if we could just take those resources and use them to support, to su take that same money we were happy to spend on the care of the NAS babies and take that and, 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 and build systems to support them and to, do, to support parenting uh, groups as they get older, we would get a tremendous bang for the buck because the amount of money that is saved using this is pretty, is pretty substantial. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's about $1.8 million a year uh, in our institution alone. So Boston, some examples of how this is spread. So Boston Medical Center, they've been using this Finnegan approach. Um, they started to sort of adjust Finnegan a little bit. And then they started using Eat, Sleep, Console as a tool, and they, they actually turned it into a tool, which uh, you'll, you will find a quite complicated Eat, Sleep, Console tool uh, out there that is really uh, unnecessary. Uh, this is secretly, um, don't tell anyone this, but Eat, Sleep, Console is actually how we uh, evaluate all babies. Um, it's just how babies are functioning. So it doesn't need a scoring tool. And in fact, a scoring tool can, can complicate it and make it slower to respond. Uh, but what they did is they found that their morphine use decreased from 82% to 40%. Their length of stay went down from 18 days to 10 days, and they had no readmissions. They were not satisfied with this. And so they actually brought a team down to, uh, to hang out with us and then went over some of the other little details that we were doing. And they've since reduced their length of stay even more, and they've started using as-needed medications. Uh, there's other, a lot has been published in the last year or so about other places doing this successfully. Uh, my favorite one that I haven't published it yet is Middlesex Hospital, which is the hospital that was 30 minutes away from us, where I had to give my first talk uh, back in, I think, 2010. And um, they, nothing really changed then. And they, again, found out that we were doing this stuff and that we'd really changed things. And they came, they spent an afternoon with us, went over all the stuff we'd been doing. They met a couple of families and, and went through the experience. And on the drive home, they changed their protocols. A 30-minute drive. They, start, they changed everything that night. They said, we are not treating a baby or a family the way we've been doing it for one more day. So it was, you know, you see most folks are very, you know, wary about change and doing this very slowly and saying, okay, we'll do this element uh, in 2025. We'll do this one in 2028. They did it that night. So it was, you know, there was a culture shock for the first three weeks. And then it became how they do things. They haven't had a baby stay longer than 10 days since then, and that was about four years ago. So this is a, there's no real uh, system to, to count the spread. Uh, I just sort of count by people who have contacted me to say that they have changed it. Um, and I do have to include Washington State up there as well. So there's quite a bit more, and, and, and this is far from exhaustive, but this is we published this about three years ago. And so it has spread quite a bit. Uh, there's still not, certainly not the, uh, so most places are still using a Finnegan related approach, but, um, but we're hopeful that the change will continue. And we've certainly seen a few uh, from overseas as well that have changed. Um, so long-term outcomes, this is a real question. There's a lot more funding for this. There has been really, uh, there, there have, has been a, a lack of really good studies ever about long-term outcomes. There's more uh, investment in this and we should see more about long-term outcomes uh, using different approaches as well. So the conclusions, this is really a hugs before drugs. This is about empowering families. It's about rooming in. It's about non-pharmacologic care as a first-line treatment. It's using the eat, sleep, console approach. Meds is needed. And the three keys to treatment, mom is antibiotics. Pretend it's a baby. Treat the mom like a mom. 
And I would say there are situations, at least in our state, where the baby's going to be put in foster care. Uh, and there's very, very rarely will Child Protective Services do make that change before we discharge the baby. And so we still do all of these things with a mom, even if they're not going to go home with the baby, because first of all, it is great for the baby. Uh, it is bonding that they're going to have because there, there are lots, obviously, as you know, uh, that placement in foster care is not, not permanent. And so oftentimes the baby and mom are going to be reunited and now they've had this bonding instead of being separated at birth. That is not good for anybody. And we know for babies, they need that. And, they, and the development is really affected if they don't have that. So we are doing that no matter what. Uh, and again, if you're, doing, if you're gonna do it and you're gonna support doing it the way you've been doing it, make sure you ask why and you're able to answer all those questions and say, no, 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 I think we should keep doing it the way we're gonna do it. Uh, if, you're, if you're still using a sort of Finnegan-based approach, it's gonna be very hard uh, to do that and, and find that, that a Finnegan approach makes sense. And I think that's about it for me. We still have time for questions, I think, yeah. Yes, we do have. Thank you so much. This was uh, very well presented um, and makes so much sense. And we really appreciate your work uh, as well as you spending time with us today. My pleasure. Um, how did you reach out? How did you start working with Child Protective Services? There's lots of folks from Departments of Children and Family on the phone on the webinar today. You know, what's sort of your advice to them? Um, what happened? Yeah, so I, I, I we actually have a great relationship with Child Protective Services. So, um, and and I know you've spoken. There, there was a there, there's the, the person sort of assigned our area. Uh, we have a, we have a really close working relationship because we have the same goals in in mind. We're we're trying to do the same things, and so we're we're asking the same questions. How do we support families more? How do we make sure this isn't punitive? And so we've really come up with a nice system. Uh, you know we. We, we were in a lot of trainings uh, with you guys uh, a number of years ago together and said, oh my gosh, we're supposed to be reporting, we're supposed to be notifying, notifying Child Protective Services, it's DCF in our state, for all of these cases, but not refer them. And so we said, gosh, how do you, how do we, how do you handle a, a, a notification? And so we don't, we don't know how to do that. We don't have a way to do that. And so they worked to figure out how to do that. So it wasn't uh, any reporting wasn't punitive, which is not what happens in a lot of other states. So that relationship, it needs to be a partnership. And for for Mary Painter, who's the person in Connecticut, and I, it was really a partnership. And we've done a lot of things together. And for everyone on the webinar today, Mary Painter will be uh, with her colleague from their Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, um, will be one of our um, speakers at the August uh, events. We'll hear more about Connecticut and their approach to notifications, reports of child abuse and neglect and how they've handled that. Were there, were there any things in you know, kind of state policy that you identified that you needed to change, um, that they needed to change? How did, how did that actually happen to transition some of that within the Department of Children and Families? And what role did, did children's hospital play with making that happen? Yeah. So I think the main thing was, uh, you know, I think we, we weren't really aware of, that we were supposed to be reporting all of these patients. So we had certain criteria that if a, a mom had been in a program um, and we had a couple other things, you know, if she's in a program and, and, and was, was compliant with the program and everything else seemed okay, there, there was no referral to child protective services. Um, and basically the idea that we would there would be an investigation on every mom going through this that seemed counterproductive to us and not not what we were trying to accomplish with all the support and things like that. And I think Child Protective Services for us, DCF again, agreed with that. So it was trying to figure out the the folks who don't the that they the, the way that we had both read the the CAPTA law was that was the idea was that we we're trying that was trying to figure out how to support families. And so if Child Protective Services, if DCF could uh, be there to support families to know and look for to make sure they have all the resources like birth to three, which all in our state, uh, any baby uh, going through withdrawal is eligible for services. Um, that that would be really helpful, and so that that was that was kind of uh, saying what are we again thinking? What are we trying to accomplish here? We are not trying to make people's lives miserable. If 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 uh, we, there needs to be investigations and and foster care for those that need it, but not for everybody. 
So what what role does you know your unit play with making some of that determination between a notification? I guess I would I would kind of go back to that. When, how yeah. did you step into the affected by kind of decision? Um, meaning that and those then safety factors that this needed to be a report of potential safety factors. Yeah, it was kind of we we sort of worked with them to agree. And I, I don't I don't remember what the exactly the criteria are offhand, but if you if you met these sort of these certain safety criteria, then we would just notify uh, child protective services, and there wouldn't be an investigation. Um, mm-hmm. So that was the, the basic idea, saying like, okay, well, we we would like to investigate families in this type of situation and make sure it's a safe situation. Um, we also found that they even that there was there was fewer uh, children being put in foster care from this because they were seeing the families with the babies, and it was it was it was actually an effective thing. Instead of instead of a baby being over here and the family over here and the meeting happening, this was all happening together, and, the, and you had a bonded baby and a mom, and that that I think was impactful as well. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the questions: Did you begin to see fewer babies being placed in? Out of home care, more babies going home with birth parents. Yes, we don't have. They haven't been able to give me the numbers on that, but yes, uh, the answer is yes. But I, I don't have the the, the uh, maybe maybe Mary will have it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think we'll we'll ask Mary to speak to that. Uh, yeah, because I I think they have been tracking that um, over time. Um, there's a question about long term outcomes. Um, how many babies remained with mom versus placed in foster care after discharge? We'll ask Mary for that. Yep. But, but there's you know, some questions out there in the literature about long-term outcomes for this particular set of infants. Um, sure. what's, your, what's your sort of synopsis of that? Yeah, I would say is we don't have great data on it. We do have some pretty good data that separating babies from their moms is bad. Um, family separation, not not terribly well supported in the in the developmental literature. It's a bad idea. And so we don't know for this population in general. And we will it will take us some years to get all that data. You can find um, a, a number of studies that the problem with the studies is that they, they will start with 200 kids and they're trying to follow them, you know, through even up into school age years and you end up with 20, 20 kids that they follow up on. So it's they, they lose a lot to follow up. So the hope is to improve that. Uh, so you can find some deficits, um, certainly, but the, the the best study that's had follow-up that really had intensive follow-up and did a lot of um, family support, all their developmental and behavioral testing was normal uh, through three years. And that's what we have found at our institution as well. It's been very small numbers so far. Um, so we don't know. I will take my chances on uh, maternal infant bonding because we know when you don't have that, there are there are worse developmental and behavioral outcomes. So if you have a system that is that we know is doing something for the rest of the population that's probably not good, um, then I, I'm, I'm going to take my chances on, uh, on, on keeping, keeping mom and baby together. Mm-hmm. Um, one, of, one of the uh, comments, questions that came in uh, is about sort of counting NES as an outcome. And you all sort of were really focused on reducing the length of stay uh, particularly in the in the hospital, um, what other kinds of metrics are you using to? Is that is that still what's kind of driving all of your efforts, or are you looking at other kinds of outcomes for this particular set of families? I think you know for the in. I think most of the the action with this is going to be not. I'm, I'm an inpatient doctor, so I think. Um, I think we have found a better way to do this inpatient. I think most of what we need to figure out is um, is is how we support everybody going for, forward. So we're trying to do some stuff around that. Um, we're doing smaller things inpatient, looking at weight gain and things like that, and ways to adjust that, which again are probably not that um, uh, not that complicated. You know, we know why babies going through this don't gain a lot of weight. They're, they're using a lot of energy and they often have difficulty eating. So we find if we give them higher calorie formula, uh, they do better, not surprisingly. Um, so we're looking at things like that. But mostly it's trying to figure out the long-term outcomes. And most thinking of behavioral, developmental, school performance, those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And then one one final question before we, we sort of wrap up. Uh, 
what's your, your sort of synopsis again of the literature on uh, length of addiction, severity of the substance use disorder during pregnancy and impact on the infant? What I'll let you answer that. Yeah, so there, it's a it's a tricky one because we, you know, I, I think there's a there's there's flaws with most of the literature. You know, if you are um, if you're sticking a baby into in a NICU and and putting them in a box uh, versus somebody who's who's being held by their mom all the time, and you don't know what's going on in the study, it's hard it's hard really to um, to know that. So most of the studies have shown that there's not a a, a great correlation between like the dose of methadone and the length of stay. Uh, what we found is our length of stay is pretty much right around five to seven days for everybody. So it doesn't really make much of a difference. Uh, and the, and the, the, but there, there, has nothing, there hasn't been anything convincing linking uh, different dosages or how long you've been on it. Um, what we do find, uh, and, and something that's, that's maybe instructive is this, is more premature babies have far less withdrawal. So if you're born at 32 weeks, you're probably not going to have much withdrawal. So it's probably, the important part is probably uh, a little bit later in gestation. Mm -hmm. It would be our, our guess. Again, let me say, you know, just my sincere thanks on behalf of all of the states who are participating today, um, not just for your time today, but for uh, more than a decade of work um, that has really, you know, changing the way we're addressing these issues for families and children. And uh, congratulations to you for uh, continuing on um, with this path. And we really uh, appreciate that and recognize um, the impact that your team is having on the country. So thank you so okay. much. Thank you. It's been great to be here. All right. We'll talk soon. All great. right. Bye, everyone.